wear the thing rather than Should be working now. Testing. I think it will be better to place it right here. Down here? Yeah, yeah maybe on the left. Can people hear me? I don't hear it. Can you hear me up the top? Mike, can you hear me all right? So hello everyone, let me introduce you Dan Walsh. He is the uh, engineer architect in Red Hat and this talk is about Docker security. Okay, great to see everybody. People still wandering in. Um, I can end my pri uh, Okay, we're going to be talking today about Docker security. Okay, so obviously, anybody that's never seen me present, you realize that I speak proper English. So when you tell the word Docker, pronounced correctly, we even created it. So it's Docker, Docker, Docker. If you haven't seen me, we do this all the time. But you can also go to Docker, 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 Docker.com if you really want to study it. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a coworker who might put this together, but make sure you don't click on the GIF because then it suddenly becomes. <laughs> and you know, this is my wife's nightmare seeing this every night. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. I've been saying I, I started working on Docker about a year and a half ago, and the first one of the first things I realized is that we talk about these things called containers, and containers do not contain. If you can get one thing out of this presentation, that's what you want to get. You come out of this and say containers do not contain. If you Google containers do not contain, you will also see my pretty face, because I've been saying this for a long time now. So one of the things we're trying to do is actually make containers contain. What I mean by that is make them secure, make them so that you can have a multi-tenant environment. I often hear of companies taking Docker, putting them up, and allowing anybody to upload any Docker file and run them. Even OpenShift is considering doing this, and it makes me cringe when I think about it. So we're going to talk about what we're doing. What, uh, first of all, we're going to start by talking about whether or not you care if Docker if containers contain. I would argue in a lot of cases you shouldn't care that containers do not contain. Then we're going to talk about what we're trying to do to make them contain, and then we're going to enter into some other security uh, concepts. But basically, uh, when you look at Docker, uh, we're going to look at security of making sure these containers stay separate from each other. Secondarily, we're going to look at things like signing and eventually authorization and authentication. Some of the stuff we're going to cover is in the current Docker. Some of the stuff is going to be coming very soon, and some of the stuff I want to get in in the next six to nine months. So do you care? Does anybody care here that Docker containers do not contain? A few of you do, OK? I would argue that in most cases, you shouldn't care that containers do not contain. OK? The containers do not provide you security enough to, rend to download random crap from the internet and install it on your machine. So Docker right now has had several CVEs where people have gone out and grabbed a, a random Docker blob and Docker image, download the machine, and their uh, tool to install a, install a Docker image uses tar. And what's happened with the tar is the tar has actually gone out, and you can put stuff into a tar ball that would cause it to redirect to other parts of the system. So what they've been able to do, so what a hacker has been able to do is to attack your system by tricking Docker's install capabilities to write on the other parts of the system. So Docker's got a lot of CVEs because of this. But I argue 
you know, RPM has the same capability, right? I can put a post install script into an RPM program that can hack your machine. So if I can convince you to download my piece of crap and install it on your machine, I can take it over. So why is Docker any different? Why, are the people, why do people have this vision that Docker, if I install something on my machine as a privileged process, I deserve to be hacked? Bottom line. Okay, so we shouldn't think that there's like some magic cure to this container thing. If I'm installing stuff on my machine, I can be hacked. So you have to install trusted images. The same thing we've been trying to convince customers for the last 15 years, 20 years of Red Hat, is that you get trusted content from a registry, a place that you trust. Okay, so if you're gonna get trusted, if you wanna get a Docker image, which is nothing more than a new uh, way of shipping software, it has to come from a trusted source. Bottom line, okay? If you do that, then you shouldn't care so much about con um, contain, uh, containers do not contain. When we're using containers, we have to treat them like services, right? Do you care that uh, your random Apache script program um, doesn't contain? Okay, because it runs as UID, uh, UID 60. If I install Apache on my machine, it's running as UID 60. Do you know how much privilege UID 60 has in your machine? It can connect to any network port. It can listen to any network port. It can run any set UID application on your machine, right? It can read any read readable file on your machine. It can write any writable, you know, world writable content. But we don't think about containing the Apache server. So if I run the Apache server in a container, I should think the same way. Right? It's a little better. Con Docker's con Docker contains better than just UID 60. But if I'm setting up an Apache application on my machine and I'm running in a container, I shouldn't really care about whether or not it can break out through the Docker security, or to the, through the levels of security we're adding. Um, but what I, when I talk about security, I'm worried about privileged processes. Okay? So if I run a privileged process inside of a container, I should treat it as root. Root is root inside of a uh, container. Don't think of it differently at this point. Let's not think of it differently. From common criteria point of view, when I talk to the analysts, I say, treat, give me common criteria, but just say root inside a container is root outside the container. You still want to do all the security things that you always did before. So if you're running a service inside of a container that drops privileges quickly, keep it dropping privileges. So Apache inside of a container should continue to run as UID 60 inside of the container. So you want to drop the privileges as quickly as possible, treat it as like a regular privilege processes. You want, you run, you want to run services as non-root whenever possible, and you want to treat root and containers as if they were uh, root outside of the system. And then don't run random crap on your machine which you know, should just be so obvious at this point, you don't want to do that. So where containers don't contain becomes a problem is on a multi-tenant, should be on a multi-tenant environment as long as we follow these services. But if you're just using containers, Docker containers or other kind of containers on your system, just use the good security practices that you've been using all along. And of course, set and force one. But okay, we'll get to that in a minute. So why don't containers contain? Well, the number one reason, unlike KVM, everything is not namespaced. So when you're running a virtual machine, there's this whole sort of um, KVM environment that basically isolates your system totally from the host system. In containers, we don't have that, that type of uh, security. Everybody knows what namespaces are? If you've seen me do Docker, 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 you've uh, heard about it. But namespaces is basically a way to change the worldview of the system from the process's point of view. So uh, things like PID namespace basically eliminates your view of all the processes on the system. Network namespace gives you your own network view, different from the, the host network. Uh, so there's about five or six namespaces that we take advantage of, but we don't, other parts of the system like SE Linux, C groups, um, lots and lots of the system is not namespace. The device namespace, the file system namespaces, uh, I mean, uh, the, the file system devices are not namespaced. So it's not comprehensive like KVM. Kernel file systems like Sys, uh, SysFS, ProxSys, totally not namespace. So if I can write to those, I can take over the system. C groups, SE Linux, dev mem, kernel modules, all not namespace. So you can't like, load individual kernel modules into the kernel and not expect, expect to take the machine over. 
So let's look at what has been added to Docker at this point to try to make containers stay isolated. So the first thing they did at Docker is they do use read-only mount points. So the idea is we want to set up the container environment, set up the, uh, the, the, uh, the container environment so that all the processes that, that have to be there, like slash proc, slash sys, um, that have to be inside of the container in order for processes to run, they expect that, that environment or that API to be available, we want to mount those as read-only. So if I can mount proc sys into the container and it's read-only, then the processes inside the container can't write to it. So sys, proc sys, proc six trigger, proc IRQ, proc bus are all mounted read-only. We're going to get in a minute, and everybody says, well, if I'm a privileged processor, can I mount them, re, uh, remount them, rewrite? Well, we're going to get into why you can't do that. So we also are going to eliminate the ability to mount anything inside the container. So we want to make, you know, since we're mounting everything, a lot of things read only, we want to um, prevent re mounting, you know, remounting and rewrite by eliminating the mount command. Uh, in Docker upstream right now, and I think it might be in 1.5, we actually have the way to run the entire image read only. So there's going to be flags that you can say, I want to mount the images inside of the container as read only. So you can start to treat, you know, you, you basically get a read writable slash run and maybe slash temp and then everything else is read only inside of the container. Capabilities. Everybody in the room knows what capabilities are? All right. Oh, I guess everybody else is shy, so as everybody in the room should know what capabilities are if you consider yourself a Linux person. So capabilities were developed in uh, probably in the 1990s uh, to basically try to take the power of root and, and break it down into less powerful things. Okay, so right now everybody knows that if you're root, you can do anything on the system. Well, with capabilities, I can actually have a root process and start to take away some capabilities of it. Uh, so they started out with a 32-bit flag of capabilities um, on the system, um, and they, they start, told the kernel guys, start to think about the security requirements of different things that you're doing inside the kernel, and then wrap it with a capability. So if, for instance, uh, back in 1968, when there were uh, like 12 com computers at universities in the world, it was decided that if you could bind to a port less than 1024, then you should be trusted, okay? So in 1968, there was only 12 computers in the world, so we'd have users on the computers and then we'd have administrators. So if the computers were networked together through, used, through the early versions of internet or whatever they called it back then, if you were buying to a port less than 1024, you were trusted. Well, guess what? 60 years later or wherever we are now, that's still a rule. So that is the reason that you cannot bind to port 80 if you are not root on a system. Because if you could bind to port root, you should be trusted. So that rule is in a capability. So with the capability for doing that is net bind mount, or net, net I, uh, whatever it is. So there's a capability for that, that just to being able to bind to a port less than 1024. Uh, ping uses the ability to send raw IP sockets. So there's a capability for being able to send uh, raw IP sockets. So we, we started out with 32, and the kernel guys were real good in the beginning about breaking down these capabilities into nice little chunks. So what happens with the kernel engineer once he gets this, once we get up to 28 capabilities and there are only four left? What's the kernel guy going to do at that point? He's going to start saying, hmm, uh, I'm running out. I really don't want to create a new capability, so I'm going to start taking this capability and add it to an existing capability, right? This, this security type thing and, and add it to another capability. Another thing that kernel guys do is they're really friggin' lazy because it takes a lot of work. It's just sort of like registering network, node, or network ports. No one does it uh, because it's a pain in the ass. So kernel guys started saying, rather than me going out and doing all this work to reserve a capability, I'm just going to start throwing it on. So we ended up with these, cap these capabilities one like uh, sysadmin, which I'm going to show you in a minute, which has incredible ability, you know, incredible capabilities. It basically, you own the system. It's this equivalent to root. Um, so certain capabilities are really tight, and other capabilities got loose. We, uh, in the last few years, we've added 32 more capabilities. So they basically added a new bit string um, to the system. So now that there are another 32 capabilities, I think we've used up about 36 or 37 of uh, the total of 64 capabilities that are available at this point. So this is a man page. If you look at capabilities, you can find out a little bit more about it. 
Here are the capabilities that we're removing from Docker. So we're removing the ability to uh, set process capabilities, uh, load kernel modules, use RAR I.O. in the system, um, be able to send audit messages, things like that. Uh, be able to read all the kernel messages that come out, because if I can read the kernel messages, I'm probably going to discover what other uh, containers are running on the system. So these are the two big capabilities that we also uh, remove capabilities. So there's cap net, net admin, which allows you to configure the network. We don't want the processes inside of a container to be able to modify their network settings. We want to modify the network settings from the outside, or have a tool like Kubernetes that launches the Docker container, set up the capabilities, uh, set up the network. But we don't want the, net the process inside setting up the network. So cap net, net admin allows you to do things like set up IP, IP tables rules, uh, configure the network, change the routing table. So you can't do that inside of a, a, a standard container. This is the huge catch-all, which is cap sysadmin. So to give you an idea of cap, so we also eliminate cap sysadmin, and this is the way we get rid of mount. So those are some of the rules for what a cap sysadmin. This is where the kernel engineers got really friggin' lazy. Um, so you have everything from turning swap on and off to the mount command to setting the host name, domain name, configuring. Oh, that's right. There's another page of them here. Uh, so uh, these are all the rules. And, th and this is just if they've actually documented all the things that CAP sysadmin is allowed. So when you get a container and you say, I need to be able to do X, Y, Z, and you actually add CAP sysadmin in, you have basically eliminated any chance of this container being contained at all from a capabilities point of view. In current Docker, we now have the ability to modify the list of capabilities. So we still allow, by the way, about 15 capabilities, and I probably should put them onto the slides, the ones that are currently allowed, like set the ability set UID. So you can change the UID inside of a container because most of the processes want to allow you to, you know, you, can, you, need, you need to be able to run processes inside of your container with different UIDs. Going back to the first example, I want your Apache server to run as UID 60. Well, that calls a set UID call in order to change that. But if you're going to run a container that doesn't need set UID, you can actually remove it, or you can add it. So if you decide that you have to allow mounting inside of your container, you can do a cat dash dash cap add um, on the Docker command that has capabilities. Uh, we have an example. Someone's trying to build an NTPD uh, container. Uh, actually, the IPA guys are doing it. And what they want to do is run NTPD, and guess what? NTPD has to modify the system time, so it needs cap sys time added. So you could run a command like that to add cap, uh, um, cap add sys time. And then you can also drop capabilities. So if, this is one of the things that no one ever does, but if you really cared about security and you wanted to crank up the security, you can actually turn on, or turn off certain capabilities or drop certain capabilities. So you could do a cap drop of set UID, and all of a sudden, you're, if anybody tries to call set UID, it's going to get denied. Another way we add security to a container is namespaces. Now, namespaces, when I traditionally do a Docker talk, I don't consider namespaces a security measure. But uh, namespaces are really about changing worldview. But if you think about it, if I use the PID namespace, I lose the ability to see other processes on the system. So the processes suddenly get denied, uh, dis disappear. On an OpenShift system, since we, uh, uh, version two of OpenShift, we don't use um, this namespace right now. So if you went and tried to look, you'd see all these processes on your system, but you'd get SE Linux is blocking you from seeing it. So you see like this, it's sort of a weird looking um, slash proc environment because you get permission denied all over the places. Uh, but with PID namespace, you actually, all the PIDs just suddenly disappear from the system. All you're going to see is the processes inside of your namespace. So you could consider that a security measure that you don't know there are other processes. So your processes in your machine think that they're the only processes in the environment. Network namespace is also another one because we can control the network. So since we're controlling the network on the outside, we can add IP tables rules, we can control, we can basically set up a container that can only see the internet, another container that only can see the internet. So we can basically take a, a container and sort of change its view of the entire sy system world. So, I mean, we could uh, talk about other namespaces, but basically, through the use of namespaces, we're changing what a, uh, a container process can see and what they can imagine. 
Um, actually, uh, uh, Leonard does a really good job with namespaces and security in System D. So if you ever played with private net, private temp, um, that's taking advantage of namespace and really adding security to it, even though it's just using namespaces. There's another namespace called the device namespace. I absolutely hate that this is a namespace and not a C group. I believe this should be a C group and not a namespace. Oh, I did it wrong. This slide is wrong. It's the other way around. This is the, uh, it's the device C group. It's not a namespace. I've got to fix this slide uh, if I do this at the summit. Um, so there's a device C group, and it should be a namespace. So there is a, what you can do with a C group, uh, the um, device C group, is I can specify which devices I will allow the process inside the system to create. So if I can create, say, a, a device that can talk, you know, a rev mo uh, raw memory device and start communicating with, I can interfere with the kernel. So we want to take certain network uh, device nodes and not allow those to be created inside of a container, and this C group does. Why I would rather have it be a namespace than a C group is uh, the way we use C groups. Uh, C groups can't, you can't set up a hierarchy of C groups. So anyways, I have to fix this slide because it totally ruined what I, my presentation right there. But anyway, so uh, with the device C group, we can basically say, oh yeah, you can create a dev null, you can create a, uh, a, a dev zero, you can create certain devices. Basically, it's a white list of devices that you're allowed to create inside the container. Personally, I would rather get rid of devices altogether. There is a cap, make dev, that should be, uh, I would like to have uh, eliminated from the container and just make anybody that tries to create a device node disallowed. We also, um, device, uh, I already covered that. So these are the device nodes that we actually do allow into the container. Uh, dev console, dev zero, dev null, uh, dev fuse, full, we allow you to create TTYs uh, and you random and random. We also mount, so you, if you provide an image, a Docker image, you could put a device node onto the, onto the image and then convince me to run it inside of a container. But all the, all the device images are mounted, no device. Which means that if you have a block device or a CAD device on side of your image and mounted into my system, the kernel will stop you from being able, being able to use that device, even though it's set up as a device node. App Armor, everybody ever hear of that? Me neither. Okay. <laughs> uh, so here we are, the SE Linux guy. He's going to talk about SE Linux. Okay, everybody get up. Come on, nice comfy seats. Everybody stretch a minute. All right, let's read after me. <laughs> SE Linux is a labeling system. Every process is a label. Every file, every system object, every directory has a label. See, if I switch the words around, I get confused. Okay. <laughs> Policy rules control access between labeled process and labeled objects. <laughs> you guys are, you're really not hitting it steady. The kernel enforces the rules. Okay, now you can all sit down because we all understand SE Linux, right? <laughs> Woo! Now, I asked some of the SE Linux guys here to put together the SE Linux coloring book. I don't know if they printed it out or not. If everybody can get access to the SE Linux coloring book, it takes it into deep detail of how SE Linux works, and you can color at the same time. So it's a really awesome experience, and if you haven't seen it, uh, we're going to show some of the pictures of it in a minute. So uh, everybody has gone to this website, I'm sure. Okay, stop. That's on my back of my shirt. This is Major Hayden from... Um, Rackspace put this one together, and I actually weep every time you say set and force one, very zero. <laughs> so how does SE Linux work inside of a container environment? SE Linux provides two types of enforcement in a container environment. We take advantage of a thing called type enforcement. So SE Linux fundamentally, most people that have ever dealt with SE Linux I mean, they might not know it's type enforcement, but it's basically SE Linux's primary goal is type enforcement. And what we do is we define a type of a process. 
So this is the Apache process, it's going to run as the Apache type. This is the Apache content, it's going to run as, you know, on disk, so it's labeled as Apache content. And then I write rules that say the Apache process type can read Apache content. Then I create read-writable Apache content, and I say the Apache process can write read-writable Apache content. When the Apache process gets hacked, like it did with um, Shellshock, if anybody reads my blog, you'll know that SE Linux did a real good job of controlling Shellshock. So someone wrote an exploit that went to an Apache website and was able to inject code into an HTTP script running uh, on a server. Every single HTTP script that written Bash in the world was susceptible to Shellshock. So anybody who was running a CGI script in the world using Bash was susceptible. When they injected the code into it, then that process would be running on a remote machine and you would have full control of a bash script on a remote machine. That's how dangerous shell shock was. In an SE Linux environment, if you said enforce one, that CGI script would be labeled as CGI script T. And when it went and tried to do anything on your system, it'd say, oh, you want to read Apache content? Welcome to it. You want to write to an Apache directory? Welcome to it. You want to connect to a network port and send out spam mail? Denied. You want to connect to any network port? Denied. Okay, SE Linux controlled at the type, the type of it. So, if we go into type enforcement, now everybody understands the Apache analogy, now we'll get into the cats and dogs. And this is where you have to get a hold of the cat coloring book. And hopefully in the next two days, someone will have printed out some coloring books. But we look at cats and dogs. So we have a cat type and a dog type and we label our content, so we have cat chow and dog chow. Now we write rules that says allow cats to eat cat chow food, and he's allowed to eat it, and we write a rule that says allow a dog to eat content that is labeled as dog food, and it, or dog chow, and it's food, and he's allowed to eat it. This is very much like every single rule. This is almost exactly what we write in SE Linux policy. If the dog gets hungry, so now we allow the cat to eat its cat food and the dog to eat its dog food. If the cat wants more, the kernel will allow it to have more cat food. But if the dog tries to eat the cat food, no way, okay? Everybody got it? Now everybody's going to walk and say, SE Linux is easy, right? So I beat that to death, let's go on. MCS enforcement. Oh, so I probably should cover this for Docker, I guess. So in Docker terms, we run every single container with svert lxc net t, which basically says it's a container, and then we label all the content inside of the container as svert sandbox file t. In the United States, there's an expression, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Anybody ever hear that expression? That's not an American? Okay, or if you've ever seen the, uh, the, the movie uh, The Hangover, and if you haven't seen The Hangover, you should go rent it. It's an excellent movie. So the idea is that we want to basically take a container and say, you are in a container, your job is to be in a container. We don't care what you do in the container, just don't bother your neighbors. Okay, so we want to make sure that the container doesn't bother other containers on the system. We also want to make sure the container doesn't bother the host. So using this containment of type enforcement, we're able to control a container from mucking around with the host. Okay, because an SVRT process is able to do anything it wants to other SVRT processes because they're able to do it inside the container, and all the contents labeled as SVRT sandbox T. So if this container breaks out and tries to read your home directory content or your credit cards inside of your database, it's blocked. But if it tries to attack other containers, they're all labeled SVRT LXC net T, other processes are all labeled, so it's able to attack other processes on the system, and it's able to attack the content, because the content's all labeled the same. So you say, Dan, hold on, I thought we were trying to make containers contain. Well, they don't from attacking each other using type enforcement. So we take advantage of a separate part of SE Linux called MCS, multi-category security. So multi-category security was in actually invented for our SVIRT, or for our secure virtualization. So the idea was we had lots and lots of virtual machines, we wanted to put a label on them, and we wanted to make sure that they couldn't attack each other. Well, there was a part of the SE Linux label called the MLS uh, label, the multi-level security, and if you ever looked in SE Linux label, you'll see almost all your processes always have this colon S0 at the end of the line. 
So that basically says they're running at the lowest sensitivity. But we basically, in most targeted systems, we never do anything with, with multi-level security. Only on multi-level security machines do they do that, and probably no one in this room has ever used in the multi-level security, and you're very lucky about that, because multi -level, if you think SE Linux is hard, you should try MLS. So MLS is all about top secret, secret controls in the government. Uh, so, but we had this capability in SE Linux that was turned off, and we decided to make an, a new type of security called multi-category uh, security. And the only thing we do with multi-category security is we add a little uh, uh, part of the label um, that is different for each one of the containers. And then we put the, con the same part of the label on the, on the content, and then the kernel makes sure that that little uh, sort of secret end of it matches. And if it doesn't match, you're denied. And that's where we start to get, um, based on MLS, that's where we start to get the separation between processes with the like types. So again, going back to the coloring book, now we have two dogs. We have a Fido dog. I have 10 minutes left. No, I don't. There's plenty of time. Okay, I got to start racing. So, so there's two types of dogs. There's a uh, Fido and a Spot. Uh, we have the, still have the cat dog chow, but I still have the rules. It says the dog's allowed to eat dog food, but now I want to make sure the Spot doesn't eat Fido's dog food. Um, Fido's allowed to eat his dog food, but when Fido tries to uh, attack Spot's, uh, try to eat, I mean, yeah, when Fido tries to eat Spot's dog food, the kernel steps in. What we've done is we've actually added this part of the label that basically says this, this, this dog is now not only a dog, but he's also a, fight, uh, also a spot. And that's how we take care of MCS separation. I'm going to skip the demo. You can come see that later. Uh, so there's some SE Linux gotchas. And these gotchas exist for other, uh, other tools we're going to talk about later. Uh, Docker is all about the processes running inside of the container basically see sort of the container environment. But in a lot of cases, you want to take external content and put it into the container, or you want to have all writable content from inside of the container stored on the disk. So you do use these things called volume mounts, and in, in, in the real world, they're really bind mounts into the container. Uh, so one of the things you need to make sure of is that the SE Linux labels are correct. So when you ever do a volume mount into a container, if SE Linux is going to blow up on you at all, it's going to blow up in this situation. So you can basically set the type of the content that you're mounting into it, or in RHEL 7, one that's just about to come out and hopefully soon to be in Fedora. Um, you can actually add a colon Z or a colon my, uh, lowercase z to the uh, mount, mount or the volume option, and that will actually the, the Docker will take care of changing the labels. Capital Z means it's it's only shared between it's only shared uh, it's private to the container. Colon Z lowercase Z means it's shared between all containers that all containers can use it. We now have the ability to modify SE Linux controls, so you can actually, if you, again, if you want to uh, ch change the security level, so all containers run with the same security, they're allowed to use all the network that's presented to them, but you could really tighten it up further, so if you want to write, say, an Apache policy so it only could listen to port 80 and can't connect out on the network at all, you can run it with that type. And we also can support the MLS world, so we can actually tell you, set up containers so they can run as top secret. So you could set up all your containers to run at a single level. Uh, and then this is my last little slide on SE Linux that, uh, and, and again, this is probably an American thing, but there was always a commercial about Tupperware and that you, could, you knew your food was safe when you had the burp. So uh, Docker without SE Linux is like Tupperware without the burp. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about other uh, attack services. So we've, we've added capabilities. We've added read-only bind mounts. Uh, we use SE Linux to make sure we can uh, not break out. We're using good security practices. The problem with all of these is you still have this huge attack service on the kernel. If you are allowed to talk to the kernel and the kernel has a bug, I'm able to break out of my confinement. Okay, this is a big advantage, a big disadvantage of containers over virtualization in that you're talking directly to the real kernel. In a virtualization environment, I have to talk to the kernel on my virtualization, I have to break through that. Then I have to break through KVM. Then I got to break through SVIRT before I can ever even talk to the local kernel. Well, all those exploits have already been broken away when you're running containers. You're talking directly to the real kernel. So there's a thing called libseccomp. Libseccomp and seccomp are the ability to uh, modify the syscall table that's available to process inside of a container. So what we want to do is, um, right now, we. We're real close to getting this merged upstream. No, this doesn't exist in the real world, but um, 
we're real close to getting it into the, into the real world, so that we can start to eliminate certain syscalls uh, from the container. Uh, some of this stuff was stolen from systemd and spawn, but like some of these uh, uh, syscalls here that are eliminated are things that you really don't want. Uh, Docker had a very big uh, hole in its security level, open by handle at, allows you to open a file by picking out the, uh, uh, by just giving it a inode. Well, guess what? Slash on the system is a well-known inode. So if I have this, cap this uh, uh, syscall, then I can basically figure out a way to break out of the container, and of course with SC Linux turned off, but uh, I can break out of the container and get open up the syscall directory. And once I have the syscall, I mean, once I have the slash directory, I can obviously walk the entire file system. So just having open by handle at, I'm able to break out of containers. So with syscall, uh, you know, turning off some of these other controls, but um, so with syscalls, I can, uh, with the syscall editing, I can start to do that, uh, eliminate all those. And also, we are looking at blocking old weird networks. How many people here use Apple Talk on their computers? Not many, huh? Netware, right? There's all these ancient um, uh, network controls that are available that no one ever uses and nobody ever looks at to see if there's bugs in them, okay? I'm ignoring the time. <laughs> So you're able to, uh, with, with, I have a video here that I'm not going to show, but we're going to put it up on the website. But basically, you're able to modify um, uh, syscalls. The, uh, you're able to add and remove um, syscalls that are available. And the demo actually shows removing uh, get, get current working directory. So all of a sudden, you type PWD, and it says not allowed. So it's kind of aggravating, but at least it's a real quick demo of what you can do with this. So it's pretty powerful. The thing called the user namespace. Uh, which the, the goal of user namespace is to map uh, all, you can basically have root inside of the container and not root outside the container, that's the idea. And what you do is you map a range of UIDs into the container um, to, um, to root, uh, IDs outside of the container. So basically you could say root inside of my container is UID 6000 outside of my container. And then the kernel will actually, inside the container, allow you to, to screw around with your namespaces. But if you try to break out, it'll say, hey, your UID 6000, you're not able to break out. Um, this has been merged. Um, it's still experimental. The question is, how well will it scale? Can we use it to protect the host, potentially? Can we protect any other containers from it? Yes. Um, we've merged it into libcontainers. So if you look at what Docker is, Docker relies on this. Uh, sub-library called libcontainer. So the user namespace settings have been merged into libcontainer. Uh, they still don't exist inside of the Docker proper command set. Uh, we're working on an interface to get this into Docker. Uh, so theoretically, user namespace will allow us to add additional security. It'll also allow us to tighten up the SE Linux security on it. So we can start to really tighten up things if we get user namespace. User namespace has some major problems because doing volume mounts and things like that are, are difficult. And, and the, there is some work in the kernel. Right now, I can change the UID view of the world, but I can't change file systems view of UIDs. So there's some work in the kernel to potentially allow uh, varying UIDs or based on bind mounts. And if that happens, then user namespace will get real, real interesting. So um, I think I'm going to uh, stop at this time. Uh, basically, all I've really covered is, is containing containers from each other, but there's also huge amount of talk uh, that needs, to, huge amount of work that needs to be done around image signing, authorization, authentication. But I'm going to run out of time, and I figure people probably have questions right now for me. So, anybody have any questions? Or are they just into signing and they want to talk about image signing? Nobody? Yep. Yes, I don't follow my uh, rules, yes. <laughs> Are there going to be any of the Docker? So, so it, it, as far as using Docker to contain applications on the desktop, that is not going to happen. But this man right there is going to use similar technology. Alex Larson's working on a new strategy. First of all, there's the SE Linux Sandbox, which you can play around and does uh, some, it basically takes advantage of a couple, a couple of these uh, controls to allow you to run desktop applications in a sandbox environment. 
Alex is working on uh, also using container technologies to run desktop applications and fully integrate them into the desktop environment. So eventually, hopefully, uh, uh, to really do a good job of this, we need things like Wayland. We need um, uh, to confer at the file, file manager. We need systemd dbus um, to really do a really nice job of, of sandboxing it. Right now, he's working on just you know, running containered applications and not, you know, he's basically not going to confine them in the beginning. But eventually, if we want to sandbox them and really confine them, then we have to, t we have to improve the overall operation. You can't be using X, X very well to confine applications. So there's, there's major holes in communication paths in the desktop. But Docker really is, uh, at this point, we're just looking at Docker for server, isolating server applications. Anybody else? I must have done a perfect job. Um, oh, yes. Right. Yeah. Can, can you, can you the, Where is the pull request? Yeah, yeah. Um, go to our, our, I mean, I'm on GitHub, I'm at Dan, so go look at my Docker uh, thing and you'll see my pull request and it's, it's listed in there. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, so, uh, so in con uh, conclusion, now tomorrow I'm giving a talk called Super Privileged Containers. And what the idea of super privileged containers is, is the exact opposite of everything you've seen here. So a super privileged container is supposed to be a thing that you're going to install on your machine as a system manager. So if you want to come and find out how you can configure your Docker containers to actually be able to modify and, and update the host or modify other containers, which is a really good use case for containers, you can come see that. I'm out of time. So that's it. Thank you for coming. Oh. So if, oh, one, other, one last thing. If you go to opensource.com, um, you can find uh, there's two talks, uh, two uh, articles I've written on this, one of them that goes deep into why you don't care about containers containing, and the second one covers all the security stuff I've talked about. I owe them a third one that I'm supposed to write sometime while I'm on an airplane riding six hours. So I owe them a third one to talk about new features, but the articles are written on it. Thank you for coming. Actually, at the end of the slide, I was going to cover authorization and authentication. So right now, we're working to get authentication into Docker so we can start to say who's allowed to talk to the Docker daemon. And then authorization, we want to break down. When you talk to the Docker daemon, what are you allowed to do? Right? So 